the discussion itself, itself should face the changes in scientific research, epistemology and theory through the impact of the use of digital media. That's the concrete point we should put our focus on. From our partic participants, we want to know about their view on the changes digital procedures have already in the academic and scientific field done, and we want to know as well something about their personal experiences, if possible, as working scientists, readers, writers, and teachers. So let me very, very short introduce, just to give the names to the faces. On the corner over there is Wendy Chun. Is it correctly pronounced Chun? Okay, thank you, and Wendy. Wendy is professor of modern culture and media at Brown University, and the rest of her life and CV you can read in the program book. Um, the next one is Ute Holl. She is ordinaria, that is f female ordinaria, the Swiss have the female ordinaria for Medienwissenschaft with a focus on theories of perception. <laughs> At the end, yes, okay, and her research focus is on cinema and everyone knows her actually. In the middle we have Tom Levine, he is from Princeton University and um, associate professor of German. Ordinario. Sorry? Ordinario. Ordinario? Do they say in Princeton ordinario? No, they don't. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, and we have Gerd Lovink over there, he is well known as well, and uh, he is a research professor of interactive media at the Hochschule von Amsterdam, and you just quit the, the other part of your academic, the university, okay. You, everybody switched on the microphone so you can respond. And on my left, on my right, sorry, left from your side is Nishant Shah. And Nishant is from, from, from Bangalore, and um, he's uh, just now here working at the university uh, in, uh, in Lüneburg, and uh, as well, he is the founder and director of research for the Bangalore-based Center for Internet and Society. His doctoral work at the Center of Study of Culture and Society examines the production of mm. techno-social subject um, at the intersections of law, internet, technologies, and everyday cultural practices in India. So, everyone has say much has to say much f to our to our issue. And uh, please, Wendy, go for a start and give us an initial uh, statement, and then we continue with backwards the alphabetic order with Ute, Tom, Nishant, and Gerd. Please, Wendy. Well, thank you very much for organizing the panel. I'm very excited about this conversation. As you know, we've been given five to seven minutes to discuss the impact of new media on the study of media. This is an impossible task. And so, to broach the impossible, I will talk quickly. I will talk quickly, <laughs> and I will outline three points. So just in case you get lost, let me telegraph the three points to you first immediately. So the first is, what has changed the most is what remains. What can and does remain, that is how and what remains. For things remain, remain the same, not by remaining, not by remaining isolated, not by being preserved. Things remain by leaking. So my second point is that new media is not simply about leaks. New media is not about WikiLeaks. New media is leak, right? New media works technically and socially by breaching and thus by bizarrely also sustaining the breach between the private and the public. And lastly, to understand the stakes of remaining by leaking, to understand the stakes of this leaky remaining, I'll argue that what matters most now in the era of the new is what seems to matter not at all, which is namely the habitual. So in the era of big data, our data trash is now allegedly transformed into data gold through our machinic and human um, habituation and recycling. Um, by our habituation to becoming creatures of the update. So part one, what remains. 
in order to remain, nothing can remain, so that nothing remains as everything remains. Um, information, in other words, is strangely undead, and we save things if we do by making the ephemeral endure. We save things digitally if we do by making what's stable ephemeral, by taking what's more lasting and making it, um, making it more volatile. So taking paper which can remain and be read into something absolutely volatile. And volatile not simply because of physics, not simply because electronic data decay faster than paper, but also because of our constantly changing, our manically upgrading software and hardware. Because of our constantly changing and degrading machine networks that can ensure that things that remain simply cannot be easily read because of volatile networks that mean that we, some combination of our machines and us, must constantly migrate, regenerate, that is, care for anything we want to remain. Perhaps this is why we do something that's considered impossible, at least in English. We now store things in memory. We don't store memories we store things in memory. Memory has become storage. But memory and storage traditionally are two very different things. Storage are stocks. They look to the future. We store things for the future. Memory, in contrast, looks to the past. It's an act, a painful act of commemoration. It's what's remembered. This odd conflation of memory and storage, a conflation that's perhaps not new, although newly conflated, lies at the heart of modern computation. With von Neumann's architecture, with his abstraction of function from machine, memory from store, with von Neumann, computers became human nervous machines. Machines composed of amputated, simplified, idealized neurons that contained within themselves a memory organ. A memory organ, or more properly, a hierarchy of memories um, that compromised the inside and the outside. A memory organ that brought the data and instructions inside the machine, but also rendered the rest of the world, the input and the output, the rest of the world became, for von Neumann, dead storage. Computers work by leaking. Computers are not just about leaks, they are leaks. Our machines operate by constantly repeating, constantly reading and writing and transmitting and erasing. Further, in a network, a personal device is an oxymoron. Right? An oxymoron produced by a massive screening campaign. So your Ethernet card, your Ethernet card right now is downloading every traffic. Your card acts promiscuously, right? Promiscuous mode is a technical term. Monogamous mode is not, right? So if you think your computers work monogamously, it's because they discreetly erase their indiscretions, right? <laughs> At every level, our networked machines leak. Every click can leave a trace. Every friend, every password leaves you compromised. But this, this compromising of the boundary between public and private, between what's conventional and revolutionary, between what's amateur and professional, this this is also what makes new media so wonderfully creepy. Um, for leaks, and this gets me to point number three, leaks do not automatically equal surveillance. For our leaky devices to become surveillance devices, their signals need to be captured and stored. Their signals need to be captured, stored, and correlated. And we, we must become habituated to correcting and connecting to owning to our connections. So most briefly, number three, in an era of networks, connections are habits. An edge, a connection, is a spatial representation, a spatializing of a continual, repeated action. In an era in which correlation seems to trump causality, 
So in an era in which correlations are allegedly better than causality, in an era of Hume, things remain habitually. Further, habits which are themselves leaky, habits which make leak the outside into the inside, habits no longer simply allow us, as Felix Reveson argued, to remain the same as we change, but also to become habituated to the constantly changing, to new media as endlessly renewed and renewing in order to remain. Thank you. That's a big, great statement. So we continue with Ute, please. Okay. My, um, my argument will be much simpler and I will compensate by worse English. <laughs> okay. when, um, when, when, when Wolfgang said we should come up with something personal, I was tempted to tell you the story of since our television has been turned digital, I don't seem to be able to watch a soccer game anymore and my son keeps asking me, what do you teach? <laughs> do you, and, and then he adds, do your students believe you? <laughs> um, I think in an era where all sorts of information and even knowledge can easily be retrieved, it is much more important to deal with the borders and the boundaries of knowledge. So while the first step is to focus on questions raised by available knowledge, the second and probably more important step is to find out what information has been withdrawn, what is hidden, what has been eluded, and what we are, what, uh, we are deprived of if we only concentrate on the knowledge we find. Of course, <coughs> this is not easily distinguished from ignorance. Of course, now, this kind of considering what is lost when something is retrieved has also been true for former bibliographies, which was the other model we're talking about. Obscure and occult knowledge has always been hidden in the so-called poison cabinets, but at least those cabinets were visible or at least visibly hidden. Even in an age of printing, I think information on the logics of knowledge were coded or hidden in the metadata, as we are coded by the alphabetical order Wolfgang put us into. So there you have the chance to see who is missing. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> yes. Some might have come to see what is missing. So to find what is indiscernibly missing, so something that is missing and has not left a trace, missing without a trace, has always been a problem, not only in the, in the, in the digital data. The work of minor literature, for example, or also minor sectarian scientific communities, has always been to share information of where hidden paths of research were to be found, or where other communities of knowledge and thought could be found or met or could be gathered with. But of course there's a difference to today's digital data in that um, their order is not alphanumerical as we are set up here, but it relies on iterations and we participate in these iterations by accessing the data. So there we have the circular logics which are so difficult to grasp. And scientific communities, this might be something you will be watching during the conference, tend to trace and retrace their own traces in the desert of data. It is today unnecessary to establish a canon because we are, in tracing our knowledge, always re-establishing the same canon all over, and I think you have seen that in the conference, or you will be seeing that or listening to that on the conference kinds of canons develop very quickly on Facebook. Many of my colleagues suddenly seem to be reading the same books which I had never heard of before because they are in those kind of exchange communities. Mm -hmm. Therefore, whatever we search and research, 
and find, I think, is only valuable if we can simultaneously indicate where the margins and the constraints lie of finding, if we can indicate the borders of our ignorance. But the argument I actually want to make, and this is a little astonishing, is that some of the old media have trained us well in dealing with the situation, and here I'm speaking for Domo, of course, a bit, for the film studies, for example, because in film studies, we have learned that an image only becomes meaningful in its relation to the au champ or to the off. And film has taught us that overview is no art and no virtue. Instead, determining particularity is. Also, it is for film students and cinema goers important to know that knowledge is a social relation. We need others to discuss what happened to us when we thought we knew. Thank you. Please talk. Um, three simple points. Um, the end of bibliographies was the title of our yeah. panel, mm -hmm. which I thought that's a good place to start. Um, Yesterday in the news, there was the, the uh, announcement that the television manufacturer Leuve had declared yeah. bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, that's an interesting symptom. Um, but it's not a false story that I think is, needs to be told, or at least not entirely. Um, so I have two, two nice points and one slightly lapsarian point. Two happy points and two, one sad point. Um, <laughs> So bibliography, a kind of writing graphene of books. Um, in digital media, we have a writing of new kinds of texts. I'm talking specifically about the ability which people in, who work on time-based media have long uh, longed for and finally have now the ability to take advantage of, which is the ability to cite time-based media, whether sound, whether film, um, we no longer have to rely on textual transcription, on the uh, film stills as a kind of uh, desperate attempt to come towards that asymptote of the moving image. We can cite moving images, and one shouldn't tolerate anything less than those real uh, time-based citations. Um, a kind of, not bibliographine, but an audiographine, or a televisio, or a kinematographine. Um, the text that Raymond Bellot years ago said was introuvable, mm -hmm. was not, could not be found in a certain sense, has at least in some sense been found. Um, another happy point um, when in response to the question, how does this affect your research? Um, and that is, uh, before when students would ask, you know, how do, I, how do I start thinking about a research paper? I would always tell them, well, the best place to always start is and you see it in my remarks tonight, etymology. Etymology is your friend. Just go to a good dictionary and you'll always find a really good story. Um, but there's another thing you can do now, which is go to eBay. Um, and I mean this utterly seriously. I'm, I'm in the process of building a, a database of acoustic letters that doesn't exist in any extant archive, but which you can find on eBay. And the idea of the world's flea markets now with metadata um, is both extraordinarily fun and requires new skills, um, new research methods, um, because, of course, not everybody knows how to tag their stuff that they're selling properly, and that's precisely what makes it fun. Um, but to take up uh, a point that I think Wendy beautifully uh, described about how for things to remain, they can't remain, um, the real threat to something like the future of a, of a certain kind of bibliography, a certain kind of database, is the f precisely this fact. It, libraries acquire a book and they put it on the shelf. When a library acquires, let's say, a database as a useful research tool, if it doesn't constantly attend to the updating of such a database for new 
operating systems, new releases of browsers, new interfaces, et cetera, et cetera, that database effectively becomes non-functional and disappears. We are living in an age of myriad orphan databases. Incredible amounts of work that gets done and disappears because it's not updated. To update a database requires a budget. The idea that you pay for a book and then put it on the shelf is much more appealing than the idea that you acquire a database, which costs a lot, <laughs> and then have to keep paying to keep it working. Hmm. That, this is a totally new mindset for libraries, mm -hmm. and that's an institutional yeah. imperative that is non-trivial. Um, and when, until that changes, um, we will increasingly witness the evanescence of incredible work that is done with incredible resources and uh, allows for incredible kinds of resource, research, but which, if not maintained, will be the end of a certain kind of digital bibliography. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the end of bibliography. I, I, I think that it, it, what is good about it is that it at least not asks the question of, uh, um, you know, digital research methods. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I'm very glad about that mm -hmm. because uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, I've already had uh, enough uh, a boring digital humanities debates. <laughs> and, uh, I, I'm, I'm really glad um, that at least here, either it hasn't arrived here yet, or <laughs> you've already skipped it, and I really hope <laughs> I'm the last. So, um, so let's, not, let's not go there. Um, and uh, what I uh, instead um, would like to uh, emphasize is, um, is not so much the impact of new media on, on, the, on the research itself. What I'm particularly involved in and what I'm very, very passionate about uh, are the changes, of course, maybe, let's say, towards the end of the research, namely when it uh, uh, becomes a publication. And, and there, of course, we see uh, enormous... Uh, uh, amounts of uh, things uh, uh, happening. And I, I've, I've picked out, uh, let's say, uh, three of them that, that um, I'm passionate ab ab about, but that I also think um, that um, we, um, you know, we could look at uh, just as, uh, as uh, examples. Uh, b before I will list them, um, I, I want to say also that um, I feel that um, uh, even though, you know, we, we, we can um, uh, be happy that we, we're not discussing digital humanities, I, s I, f I feel that uh, in this context here of um, the German uh, media, uh, media theory, uh, that there is a looming danger there that I think that needs to be discussed, and that is, uh, and that is this the, the model of the peer-reviewed journal that is kind of coming uh, uh, open, open access or not, uh, in fact, there doesn't really make much of a difference. But I really fear that uh, if, if this is once introduced and if this uh, kind of, uh, you know, globalization of, of international publication methods arrives here, this will be a certain debt of, of theory as we've known it in continental Europe. And this is why I, I think it's very, very important that we say categorically say no to that form uh, of knowledge production. Uh, very, very important because I think now you still have the time uh, to resist uh, this model. And, uh, and I am very, very concerned at this moment that uh, the peer-reviewed journal um, you know, will make it impossible uh, for, for theory uh, to develop. Now you could say, okay, then theory will move out, which of course I myself, I have a, a, a already a biography of that. I spent the most time of my life as a theorist already outside uh, of the university. And the, you know, this might be, uh, might be an option that the theory, you know, as it all, all once was, you know, will move again to, I don't know where, to maybe, uh, you know, uh, some kind of journalism 2.0, I don't know where, 
But um, uh, the, the, there are certain uh, um, um, modes of, of knowledge production that uh, that theory, um, you know, c can never thrive in, and uh, uh, this would be, uh, you know, um, uh, this would be a real killer, and not so much the question uh, of the the used research methods in itself, but uh, precisely uh, the modes of. Uh, publication at the very end mm -hmm. that could make uh, you know a very rich, diverse uh, theory landscape as it exists right now still exists here um, uh, impossible. Now, uh, what I uh, because I don't want to um, um, go precisely into all the publication strategies. I think we are at the moment we are still in early stages. And much is, is about the digitization of existing books and existing formats. So we're still in the process of migration. And that hasn't, we're only uh, probably only halfway somewhere there, mm -hmm. right? So um, uh, what, what I, th I think where new media really, for me personally, uh, starts to uh, um, make a difference is, uh, you've already indicated, we, we've already talked about it, is when uh, it starts to create a social dimension. And um, the, the three examples that I uh, want to uh, mention here uh, is, the first is, for instance, in the, in the production um, of the research itself. Uh, there are experiments also here at Lefana, uh, for instance, with book sprints. Now, I'm a big fan of book sprints. A book sprint is the, when you gather uh, for five days and you write a book together. Now this is this is uh, usually you know, th and we have the tools now. We can we can do it. We c uh, and you can also publish it within the within these five days. And uh, you cannot not only write it, correct it, um, uh, design it, but you can also through um, uh, EPUB and so on. So on you can uh, put it out now. Uh, I think it's, it would really be fascinating if this, uh, if this new format would also be used, let's say, in theory circles. Huh? So far, uh, that has not been the case, and this is a real uh, a challenge ahead of us. I think uh, the, the second, uh, uh, let's say, proposal or, uh, uh, is somewhat related, but, uh, um, and I've, I've been writing about it and I'm passionate about it, that is that I feel that new media, what, what, what it can really do is that it adds a level of comments and debate to existing documents. And we, uh, we have not seen enough uh, you know, experiments with that. And I've, I believe that once we are uh, you know, at the end of this phase of digitization, uh, that uh, especially uh, from Germany, wh where there is a lot of emphasis, you know, on debate, I, I, I would really, really hope that uh, you, know, you know that we all uh, uh, take a very, very good look at how we can uh, let's uh, let's say first of all save this comment space, but also maybe update it, bring it on a higher level. Um, and there, there is there is fantastic uh, possibilities uh, to. to to, for, in, for instance, uh, comment together on, on, on texts uh, that's, that's already existing. Uh, with that, I, don't, I do not only mean, uh, let's say, mailing lists and debates, although you know, I find debates also interesting and the way they, you can, uh, you can uh, save them and, and uh, can further uh, work with them, but, but that's only one level. But even on a textual level, on the level of uh, exegesis and hermeneutics, I believe there's a whole new world that uh, we can develop in terms of software, uh, you know, that is out there that we haven't really looked at. Uh, quite um, uh, um, the opposite, I would say, even. Uh, there, there is a general f uh, tendency right now to close the comment space. We, we can see that in blogs. Uh, uh, just uh, last week, uh, YouTube. Uh, announced that uh, they're about uh, to crack down very, very heavily on all the comments. Now, YouTube is uh, probably on one of the f uh, few very large spaces on the internet which is still free, where people can uh, just, uh, you know, say whatever they want. Okay, that's nasty, uh, most, most of it. Uh, but this, uh, this was one of the last spaces. Imagine, it was one of the last free spaces where people could, 
uh, you know, comment. So that's, that's over. And it's been taking over, as we know, uh, by bots, uh, uh, where, you know, whenever you say something na nasty, the bot uh, will immediately recognize it and delete it, right? Uh, so now, this is, this is really uh, where, in my opinion, we should not go. Yeah? Um, and my third uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, proposition, uh, therefore, would be to, to think about you know, what type of publication platforms we need to develop theory. Theory itself. Yeah? Uh, what, what is the uh, appropriate... Uh, form to develop theory. Uh, well, you know, I, I couldn't even think of, 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 a, of something ap appropriate, something that would be a natural environment for theory to thrive in this world. Yeah? So that's a challenge, and that is out there. Thank you. And you're here. And Nishan. Right. Um. Hi, am I audible? I can't hear myself. No, okay. Did you um, put on your thing, your no, switch this, on? This device is really freaking me out because uh, <laughs> I, I keep on feeling like at any moment I should say beam me up Scotty. Yeah, exactly. Um, right. <laughs> but at the same time, it's also Is he audible? Yes. <laughs> it's, it, at the same time, it's also making me think about uh, a Bangalore call center and I expect <laughs> to pick up a call and say, hi, my name is Nishant, what's the problem with your PC today? Um, <laughs> and I should kind of, kind of straddle between those two uh, areas, right? Um, at the, at the, uh, you know, when, when you kind of know that you're going to be at the tail end of a brilliant panel, what you really want to do is twist uh, the panel itself, right? Uh, so while a lot of people talked about the question of the bibliography and the end of it, I'm going to actually focus on the bibliographer and the end of him or her, yeah? And I'm going to take Wolfgang's comments really seriously, and I'm going to be extremely personal and biographical. And so I will begin in, contempt in recent history in 1835, <coughs> which, as you know, is my, is my chronological age. Um, so in 1835, Lord Thomas Babington Macaulay, whose parents naturally hated him if they gave him those names, um, but Lord Thomas Babington Macaulay, announced that a shelf of good, wholesome British literature was more valuable than the entire body of native literature that existed in India, right? Macaulay's mandate <laughs> was to produce minutes on education, um, trying to create a new intermediary class of Indians who would be trained to become Pakka gentlemen and Gora mm. sahibs, uh, who would help the British colonial rulers in their everyday administration. At that point, uh, Macaulay actually produced the first modern bibliography for a modern education system in India, right? This is 1835. Uh, very carefully selected works from science, literature, and history um, in order to educate the native into becoming civilized. And thus, he also produced the first regime of intellectual property rights in India. Uh, which draws from the very British notions of intellectual property, commons, ownership, possession, and so on. This particular connection between bibliographies and intellectual property is what I want to stay with today and talk about two models of the bibliographers, right? So Thomas Macaulay is the first model. Um, because it, this, this particular relationship constantly replays itself both in the production of knowledge but also in the role of knowledge production. And we want to kind of look at both those dimensions of bibliography building. Because as we already know, that bibliographies are not mere databases. So there is nothing mere about databases, as we already know. Um, that the bibliographies were not lists or guidelines about where books resided, but they were tools of dominance and administration for an entire colonial regime mm. uh, that tried to talk about how to make sense of a region. Right? And that is the first model of the bibliographer, the scientist, or the researcher. And that's the role that all of us unwittingly often play, which is about mapping the terrain mm -hmm. and creating then a canon of what is important and what needs to be read and what all needs to be filtered out in one way. Um, so the bibliography to me is very reminiscent, for example, of the census mechanism, that just the way in which the census tried to make sense of the people who resided in a particular geography or a space, the bibliography was an attempt to make sense of what resides in the intellectual terrain, right? The census and the bibliography as two databases of dominance uh, that existed within the colonial rule. Um, and 
In fact, the f in, in this, is, this is kind of interesting because at the same time, in that same document, Macaulay also talks about how India is a country with a very rich past, but a very poor history. Right? In many <laughs> forms, bibliographies are processes of writing these rich histories. So it's not ironic that the first Indian texts which were prescribed in a bibliography in the country were texts that well-meaning British scholars translated from Indian languages into English so that they could be taught back to the native and, and made familiar with what is available to mm -hmm. them as a natural mm -hmm. resource. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so that's my first model of a bibliographer. Uh, now I actually go to real contemporary history because in 2011, uh, sorry, 2012, three British publication houses, the Oxford University Press, the Cambridge University Press, and Francis and Taylor, which now hosts the famous Routledge publications, filed a case against M.S. Rameshwari, photocopier, mm. who is a single man who is 56 years old, who works in the campus of Delhi University, and he runs a photocopying shop, which means that he has three photocopying machines, and he is a new kind of bibliographer. Because what he does, he's, he collects different texts which are prescribed to undergraduate and graduate students in the university, and he creates text packages out of them, right? Which means that he does not question the canon, but he does question the ways in which canons are accessed and they are put together. Which basically means that in India, uh, where costs of education can ex be extremely prohibitive and do not allow for people to access higher education, um, if a student were to buy the entire course package that the university has prescribed, uh, he or she would be spending roughly in the domain of 700 to 1,000 euros every year, which is impossible. Yeah? But if you go to the MS Rameshwari photocopying shop, you get the same material for about 30 euros. Digitally. <laughs> No, no, physically. physically. It's a photocopied, okay. compiled textbook which is presented okay. to you as a course a package. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, and this is the new form of the bibliographer. And this is the one that we fear the most. <laughs> right? <laughs> because this is, th this is the bibliographer who's no longer going to just talk to us at the level of authorship. This is a different kind of piracy. And I want to now make a call that if we were to signal to an end of bibliography, then it has to be a call to make the researcher into a pirate, right? It is an open invitation to every scientist to think of herself as a pirate rather than a compiler of data. And I kind of want to work in the list of three because everybody else has been talking in numbers of three. <laughs> I, I don't want to feel left out um, <laughs> by talking only about two, right? Um, so I want to suggest that one of the problems with our conceptions of bibliographies has been about how it has constantly fetishized and focused on the question of authorship. Who wrote it? How did they write it? How do they attribute to it, right? Who gets royalties out of it? Nobody gets royalties out of it. Um, but anyway, uh, questions like that. To this particular idea of authorship, I want to suggest that we now start looking at two different things. One is a question of authenticity, and the second is a question of authority, right? Authenticity in the ways in which Thomas Babington Macaulay, I can't stop saying his name, uh, in the ways in which Macaulay uh, invalidated an entire body of literature, local knowledges and practices by merely saying that it does not exist and it's not important. And also at the level of authenticity about what is going to be the authentic knowledge which is no longer produced by one single individual, not even one community, but a huge amount of social, political, and cultural negotiations which are going to eventually accumulate and accrue into what can be called a bibliography. However, it will be a bibliography that one cannot imagine. It will be almost like the Tower of Babel, where too many voices, too much cacophony comes together to produce absolutely nothing but blank noise. And if that blank noise is the new condition from which the scholar as a pirate can emerge, then maybe that is where the new bibliographies need to begin. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I mean, we should leave it with one hour tonight. So we have a 20 minutes freestyle. Okay. Freestyle means reply to whatever you want to reply, comment on whatever you want to comment in the first round, short round here. And then we take maybe one or two or three questions from the audience. That's okay. So who wants to reply to what? So I want to just say something quickly about uh, Herd's comment about bot-based censorship trolling for 
uh, YouTube nasty comments. Mm -hmm. um, of course, what, what those kinds of uh, uh, bot-based uh, censorship uh, conditions do is produce new types of discourse, second order uh, ironies and, and forms of speaking that precisely recognize um, and, and, and tactically uh, respond to these conditions. And they also uh, lead to new sites for really interesting, what one could call commenting or, or expressive practices. I'm thinking one of my favorite is the user comment space on sites like Amazon, where I don't, my, perhaps one of the most famous and exquisite ones in the wake of Mitt Romney's uh, gender political moronicism about how he had a <laughs> binder full of women that he was ready to hire. Um, on Amazon, if you looked for a binder to buy for your child's school or something like that, there would be reams and reams of comments about why this is the binder that Mick Romney was talking about, and <laughs> like a whole space of political commentary and corrosive uh, nastiness um, in this kind of you know, consumer drag site. So new spaces, new discourses in response to new conditions. Pat. Just a comment. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. but you know, for me, uh, that's one part of the story. For me, the other part is, um, you know, how do, we, um, how do we recognize at all that this is going on? And for that, you really need to um, have a good nose. You need to know, for instance, the, the you know, you, you need to look for, for this. And uh, so that's, that in itself um, is, a, is maybe a good thing, yeah, because it it's also still means, and I, I'm, I'm a strong believer of that, that the internet will still have a lot of kind of, you know, dark alleys and, and, and corners and, and um, yeah. places, even, even, you know, despite um, Snowden and the NSA, I, 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 I do believe that, uh, you know, th that, uh, th that there are still these uh, spaces. But it's maybe also the task then of, um, uh, you know, the researcher, writer, theorist, critic, um, to um, to summarize yep. it, to, mm -hmm. to find it, to, Point to, to it. yeah, to collect it, yep. uh, and and to um, to summarize it, which uh, I always thought you know is is really our our um, our, our 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 task, mm -hmm. not not merely to to comment, mm -hmm. but also uh, to uh, s somehow synthesize uh, it uh, in one so way. So when it's looking somehow skeptical, right? I always look skeptical, <laughs> it's the <laughs> default look on my okay. face, yeah, no, no, no. Um, I was just trying to think through the, the, the relationship actually between here, your exchange with Tom and what you so, were so beautifully talking about in terms of what is unknown and the points of what is unknowable. And to what extent the very idea, the, the concentration on the comments and trying to think through this space um, involves us in the certain production of traces, right? Um, but don't point us towards these other things um, and how we can actually bring these two together um, and expand on what we think of the comment space. But I was also most really profoundly struck, uh, Nishant, by your comments and thinking about a couple of things. One is the odd move from Macaulay to now, right? That what we see so over and over again, it, in many ways as, as a point to say the failures of decolonization, right? That all of a sudden now, who, who is the state that comes in? It's the Indian state, right? Um, and so to what extent is the return also of the archive over a certain bibliographical impulse part of the story um, that you're telling? Um, and to also, um, your, your notion of the pirate, of course, is beautiful and um, reminds me very much of the notion of the experience, um, because pirate and experience come from the same word as well, right? And the peril, um, and how that might fit into to what you're calling for scholarship to do as well, especially in light of the unknown rather than simply in light of, of what we already see. Mm -hmm. Uh, please, Thank yeah. you. I think, I think this is a really interesting segue uh, into conversations, because I do believe that uh, while I'm making a call for 
uh, the new bibliographer, right, who's going to replace the old colonial master. There is something that's more implicit therein, which is the dislocation of the, re of the reader as well. Because in Macaulay's mind, for example, who the reader of that particular bibliography was, was very, very clear. It was supposed to be a particular kind of upper middle class Indian who would be able to be in the service of the British administrative Raj, right? And that's, that's about it. But I think what, what, what Tom and uh, Kyoto are kind of trying to suggest, this second level space of ironical discourse I thought was fascinating, is that we are no longer producing data merely so that human beings can read it. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's the point that you were making, that the unknowable is not really mm -hmm. unknowable. It's just that the human being can no longer know it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. For the first time in mm -hmm. the history of perhaps information production, yeah. we are now producing information that is in the service of non-human readers. Mm -hmm. Uh, that the distinction between mm. data and metadata or the whole discourse mm. around big data is mm. so important right now because we are realizing that the banal status updates that we make on Facebook is not really the important data. Mm -hmm. What is important is the metadata that can be read only by artificial intelligence algorithms mm. which are no longer human. And I think this dislocation mm. is interesting, right? Because mm -hmm. if we think of ourselves as researchers who are now no longer writing only for human subjects, then what is that nature of research going to be? And what are the new kinds of tools and platforms mm. that we will have to then produce in order to incorporate them? And to make it even more perverse, what does it mean that the big that the, the, the algorithm used by Google is actually an old scholarly citation, citation index? index. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. 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 But sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. You mean the page rank algorithm. OK. The audience is invited to put questions. I don't see. Oh, the big audience. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one. Yeah. Maybe if Ute wants to. Yeah. Ute, sorry. sorry. Yeah. sorry. I, think, I think we should address one thing because, yes, raise it. The, the issue of the, the, issue of the peer review. Because it seems to, to focus on that altogether. The, the idea that we might be afraid of losing control of the data we are processing. And not even processing in a subjective kind of way, but you know, accessing and thereby leaving traces. This kind of strange of fear of losing control might be a reason why peer reviewing is, uh, how do you say, Versicherung, uh, yeah? It's insurance. an insurance yeah. which seems to make knowledge stable. Well, we have to see that the great advantage of working even with things like Wikipedia is, you know, colloquial as they might be, every student knows that this is not a stable knowledge, but you have to work on it. Mm -hmm. And you always have the sense of that. So, but the, the, I mean, I'm raising this issue because as all of you know, the, the uh, Zeitschrift for Medienwissenschaft is peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. And we had long discussions on that because <laughs> it's the first peer reviewed journal in that area, mm -hmm. which means all of you, should be interested in publishing there because that'll be important for your biographies. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only, I think it's yeah. the only peer reviewed journal in German language for but our discipline. Gerd says it's the death of theory. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what he says. Huh? What? The yeah. death of theory. Yes, yeah. that's the death of theory. So that's why I'm raising the issue. Yes. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> we've discussed that, but the problem is. The, the DFG, the, the, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, won't pay unless it's peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. So that's why you are in that check. No? And I think we have to talk about that. Yeah, that's How the do trap we deal with that? Into. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we don't talk about that in public, this is going to be a kind of Rettungsring, uh, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. isn't visible Stay. as a res Yeah. Mm -hmm. no? mm -hmm. Okay. Excuse my English. I'm excited about this issue. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too. Yeah. To the Does anyone want to say something? The audience. Yes, over there, the right in the back. Reviewing. Well, I, I, Gerd, I see your concern, but then again, um, there we we were, we were just um, putting together information about um, open access in in media studies, and interestingly, um, worldwide there are hundreds of of peer-reviewed open access journals yep. uh, that are roughly um, concerned with uh, media studies, but there are only two published in Germany. 
too. So if we want to talk about media theory or any other kind of theory, so why don't we do another peer-reviewed journal and um, so no. we can we can peer review ourselves and we can publish it and we can uh, we are all happy because <laughs> <Yeah>. I, I <laughs> no <laughs> no really but I mean it because I want like to it. I wanted to apply yeah. for sh uh, mm -hmm. fellowships and I can't even you know give my my publications that I did that I like that readers like that I mm -hmm. get comments from they're not worth anything for the DFG anymore because they were not peer reviewed and that's the problem and yeah but then it's, we it's have not to stand up for me against it's the not the Sorry. JFK and, and make, make very, very clear that, you know, if there is a future for, uh, for this type of, um, um, you know, German media theory and German media research, uh, it cannot be according to those rules. And um, there's, there is still, uh, you know, I, I strongly believe there's still a great future outside of Germany uh, for for this type of uh, of working, but not along those lines. For, and I've always wondered myself, why is theory not published in those journals? And I I I have had some experiences, and I can tell that you know if you are into um, into theory, it will not be uh, accepted because theory uh, it's too much literature. Uh, there's not maybe not enough quotes or too many quotes or. Uh, you know, it it just it just doesn't want to uh, uh, fit into precisely uh, the f the format uh, that these journals require, because peer review sounds nice, you know. But then I would immediately say, within this context, okay, then open up those uh, peer reviews, yeah, uh, uh, and then uh, and not anonymous, but uh, you know, turn them into discussion forums, yeah. yeah? But that is precisely not not done. Yeah? The, there is there is some kind of implicit uh, expectation. You need to write in such a way. You need to quote these and those, uh, you know, authors and so on. We all know that it, the, the format is very strict, yeah? and uh, these are implicit rules that are forced uh, upon, uh, in particular, young generations, uh, because this is the way. Uh, you know, you you introduce this uh, uh, this this new type uh, of um, of writing uh, because I, I strongly believe that uh, the, the 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 academic uh, journal uh, it creates a new form of of discourse, a new form of writing, uh, and um, uh, so it has enormous long-term. Uh, consequences, and uh, I believe that you know, it, it, over time, it shuts down imagination, it shuts down dissent, it shuts down uh, you know the the voices of people who wanna who wanna experiment, and uh, what what it leads to is uh, in, an enormous uh, you know conformity that we see around us uh, everywhere, and that's why. But and just also structurally, it establishes a kind of control which seems to be objective while... Yeah, while it's not. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's might as well... well. well can I just, just to play devil's advocate, yeah. can I just propose Go that ahead. maybe the issue is not peer-reviewed or not, but rather the unfortunate reality uh, of the fact that there's a tendency for those the people who work in and the types of journals that are peer-reviewed to manifest that fatal, self-reproducing mediocrity of a kind of academic technocrat. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you're, you're calling for is just smarter peer-reviewed journals. There are peer-reviewed journals that are smart um, and which are theory, uh, uh, inquisitive, critical inquiry uh, at, at certain points. Um, uh, and I just wonder if it's a, it's a necessary structural problem or a contingent no, but historical but what I'm saying one. is w this format shuts down a lot of things. Yeah? Whereas yeah. I strongly believe that with the digital, <laughs> with new media, we have access to an incredible amount of tools and new formats that can even enrich you know, the, the existing uh, diversity of uh, of formats and mm -hmm. styles and, and ways of writing theory. Mm -hmm. uh, because we know the essay, uh, we, we have the interview form, we have, we have a certain... And I, I strongly believe, and I've suggested a few, like the book Sprint and others, there right. are probably many, many more, that instead of uh, closing it down, you know, we should take up the challenge 
and uh, open up a new alleys, new forms. Uh, new mm -hmm. forms. Mm -hmm. And okay. this is... Uh, uh, yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, uh. I, I, I take a last question from the audience, if it's not about peer review, please. Uh, no. <laughs> The microphone is coming. Just wait a yeah. second. Um, I'm wondering about um, kind of the difference between 1835 and now in terms of text culture. Um, because the end of bibliographies, of course, also calls into question the end of the book or kind of the reappearance or the remaining of the book uh, in new circumstances, maybe. And as Tom Levine so nicely pointed out that we have this new situation where citation is not restricted any longer to the format of the text. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we not only turn peer review, uh, whatever meetings, into discussion forums, but also turn scholarly research from writing and uh, text publication into something else with these yeah. media. What Remixing. your thoughts are about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? I would say that's a beautiful example of one of one of the many kinds of new formats that the Hertz is calling for, a kind of yeah. funky uh, polymorphous remixing as a, as a <laughs> mode yes. of production. Yes. Right, yeah. but if I understand here your point correctly, it's not just the peer review, it's the embedding of the peer review as a certain gold standard f for promotion, of right? Course, and right. that's the question that was mm -hmm. brought up. So can yeah. I can imagine a bureaucratic system in which we say, we take all these funky, great publications, but we value them in the same way. Way, right under the terms of this you get one tick you get to be a postdoc you get two <laughs> ticks you get to be an assistant professor so so my question to you here is are you talking about something inherently about the peer review model of the journal or are you talking about the ways in which it's embedded within a certain bureaucratic logic that your economy of academic capital. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but can I just add to that and say that this bureaucratic logic is actually at the heart of what is also wrong with the university administrative structure, right? Because that bureaucratic logic actually makes now it possible for you to be a scholar mm -hmm. without being a public intellectual. Mm -hmm. I find it very difficult to understand yeah. that. Mm -hmm. How can you claim scholarship and then have no responsibilities towards mm -hmm. translating it? Right, giving it back into the society. Mm -hmm. uh, some of my heroes, at least India, but also people on this panel, are people who have constantly translated that knowledge back into activist circles, into mm. looking at different conditions of what is at stake. Mm. What is at stake is not that job. If, on, if the only thing that you're looking for is a university job, then go and publish in mediocre journals. Mm. But I, <laughs> you know, it's fine. I mean, do it. We've all done it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I work with a lot of young students, and it's interesting mm. because they have now pointed out that it's much easier to publish in these mediocre peer-reviewed journals than making a substantial entry and edit on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. The amount of yep. rigor that is required to make a substantial entry on a Wikipedia page <laughs> is significantly higher than publishing with a stupid journal that you can mm. like cite, right? And maybe that's the domain change we kind of need to make. Right, but I wouldn't point to Wikipedia as the model given not, its sort not, of not as not, no, no, editorial not, not, nastiness, not right? Not glorifying yeah, no, yeah, it yeah, at yeah, all, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. the fact that there are other kinds of peer review models available which are Absolutely. not tied to the curatorial slash logic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, slash dot. Yeah. 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 To that peak of the discussion, I want to close this evening <laughs> saying in German uh, Vorhang zu und alle Fragen offen, as the man said who just passed away. Thank you very much. Thank you.